Myers, elected fellow of the American Physical Society, an honor held by the top 10% of physicists in the U.S., voted by New York Magazine as one of the top 100 smartest New Yorkers. <laughs> and his book, Hyperspace, and he's got a new book called Visions, and uh, that basically is uh, a treatise, I guess, on how science will revolutionize the 21st century. In other words, the changes that we can expect. So here is a man who is into just about every area that we have discussed on this program, including time travel. Should be an interesting evening. Now, one of the top 100 smartest New Yorkers. <laughs> Here is Dr. Kaku. Hi, Doctor. Hi, glad to be on your show. Uh, more than happy to have you. You're into all sorts of things that I am mm -hmm. interested in. And uh, I am surprised that I have not before heard your name. And, and I just don't know how I've missed you. I should have run into you a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, higher dimensions. Doctor, we have talked many, many times about other dimensions as explanations for all kinds of things. Uh, UFOs, creatures we can't account for, things that appear to disappear, appear and then disappear, stories that uh, people will tell that others consider fish stories, the paranormal, in other words. Mm -hmm. um, what support is there? Uh, and I certainly had no idea that um, in theoretical physics now, just about the number one topic is other dimensions. I had no idea that was going on. That's right. The, perhaps the greatest movement in theoretical physics in the last 30, 40 years, I think, is the movement toward hyperspace. Um, you see, the goal of physics is to attain the holy grail, the, uh, an equation one inch long, which would explain the four fundamental forces that govern the universe. We have gravity that holds us to the Earth. Mm -hmm. We have electricity and magnetism that lights up our cities and l illuminates the cosmos. And we have the two nuclear forces that lights up the stars and the galaxies. And yet these four fundamental forces don't look anything like each other at all. And for, for many, many decades, the greatest scientists of the century, Einstein and Heisenberg and Pauli, have tried to fit these four jigsaw puzzle pieces together, and they wouldn't fit. Now we physicists realize that if you simply go to a higher dimension, that is to ten dimensions, you have enough room in which to fit all four fundamental forces into a very simple equation. These equations, by the way, are pages and pages long, and they collapse to an equation just a few inches long if you go to ten-dimensional hyperspace with little strings vibrating in them. Now, this is such a fantastic development. Uh, already about 10,000 papers have been published in nuclear physics journals, including nuclear physics, physical review, physical review letters. You go to any modern research center at Harvard, Princeton, Caltech, MIT, and they're just books and books. In fact, my books are, are in, in fact, the Bible on this subject. I wrote the basic textbooks for the subject. But the average person doesn't know about this. Including, and, including me. So let me stop you right away and ask you, you're talking about ten dimensions. I know of three. Mm -hmm. I can see three or experience three. And I can't even imagine what the fourth is, much less the tenth. Yeah. If you think of the fourth dimension being time, Einstein gave us a four-dimensional way in which we can visualize the universe, right? Right. However, we realize that Einstein didn't go far enough, and he spent the last 30 years of his life beating his head against the wall at Princeton, trying to find a theory that would explain galaxies, the stars, the Big Bang, as well as the lilies of the field and chemistry and perhaps even love. However, he failed because he didn't go far enough. We think now that if you had dimensions higher than four, up to ten dimensions, then you can include all the forces of the universe. Now, let me explain. When I was a child growing up in San Francisco, I used to go to the Japanese tea garden. And as you know, there are fish, carp, that swim just beneath the lily pads in a oh, yes. very shallow pond. Yes. And I asked a question that only a child would ask, and that is, what would the universe look like to a fish? Well, to a fish, the world would be flat, two-dimensional. You could swim forward, backward, left, and right. But anyone who said there's a direction called up, outside the lily pads, outside the universe, would be considered 
crazy, would be considered a lunatic, you know, uh, uh, somebody that has, has to be sent to the loony farm. <laughs> However, I once thought, what happens if you reach down now and grab one of the fish? Lifted the fish into hyperspace, the third dimension. Right. This fish would see world unseen. New laws of physics would start to, to, to unfold. People moving without fins. Yes. Uh, people breathing without water. A whole new law of physics erupting once you go into hyperspace. And then if you put the fish back in the pond, can you imagine the tales this fish is going to tell? Yes, and, and how, uh, what sort of derisive life he would be leading? That's right. <laughs> uh, he would have disappeared out of the pond and simply rematerialized someplace right. else. Right. Now, we, as beings in hyperspace, looking down on the fish, say, well, these fish are silly. They're simply two-dimensional things. Why don't they realize that the universe is obviously in, in hyperspace? We would have the powers of a god. We'd be able to lift fish out of the pond, put them back anywhere else, whereupon they would uh, rematerialize out of nowhere. We could reach into safes and, and take out gold. It would be child's play to reach into any sealed container and take out the gold. Now, the revolution in physics in the last, oh, ten years has been the realization that we are the fish. We spend our life smugly, arrogantly, in three dimensions, moving forward, backward, left, right, up, down. Yes, thinking that what we see in our little pond is all there is. But you see, that can't be true, because in three dimensions, there's not enough room to explain gravity, the nuclear force, the electromagnetic forces. But in ten-dimensional hyperspace, everything collapses down to an equation so simple you could put it in your pocket. So in other words, as Stephen Hawking has stated, we are now about to read the mind of God. Now, some of you may have uh, a few of you may have tried to read his book, uh, Brief History of Time, and fewer still may have actually finished his book. Well, my book takes you beyond where Stephen Hawking leaves off. He ends his book, by the way, by saying that, wait, there's this new theory on the horizon. It's a theory defined in ten dimensions. It's the most fantastic theory physicists have ever seen. I'm constantly amazed by this theory. However, I'm at the end of my book, so, the end. The he end. ends his book. Mm -hmm. He ends his book on what I think is the greatest romance of, of the last half century, and that's the romance of hyperspace. And that's why I decided to write a book for people that don't know any math at all. People that never took a physics course in their life would appreciate a book explaining how hyperspace could explain black holes, the possibility of time travel, uh, the intricacies of perhaps life in outer space. And that's why I decided to write the book Hyperspace, which the New York Times called one of the best science books of the year. Uh, both the Washington Post and the New York Times uh, loved the book and said it was one of the best books they've seen in the area of science. So I want the average person to realize that the feats of the paranormal are child's play if you are a being living in hyperspace, looking down on the pond that we so arrogantly believe in hmm. our universe. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of people, of course, who would be uh, very angry at such a concept. Many of them uh, are religious folks, like Pat Robertson and company, uh, who live within this th three-dimensional universe and uh, staunchly refuse to imagine anything at all uh, beyond that that ha does not have something to do with that being they call the Creator, God. Well, you know, at the turn of the century, uh, there was a lot of speculation by religious people, by theologians, as to where to place heaven and earth. And in my book, Hyperspace, I, I did some research on this. And there was a debate, uh, because people had telescopes at the turn of the century. They looked for heaven, and they couldn't find it. And the Church, was, the church of England, in fact, was quite embarrassed that there was no place for heaven. However, at that time, mathematicians had discovered hyperspace for the first time. It wasn't a physical theory. It was a mathematical theory. And theologians love the idea, because why not place heaven in the fourth, fifth, sixth dimensions? It'd be, you couldn't see it. It'd be all around you, just like the pond. You know, the, the hyperspace touches every single point of the pond, and it would be everywhere, and that's a place where you could put heaven, or for that matter, ghosts, because any, anyone who lives in hyperspace 